Question 14, are there different degrees of sin like abominations? And if so, are there some sins that aren't able to be forgiven? Okay, so, you know, you go and, and you look at like uh, Catholic theology and you've got mortal sins and I think uh, what's called venial sins, I forgot the name, but basically they've got different classifications for sins. Some sins that will, you know, send you to purgatory, some sins are going to send you to hell, and so on and so forth. In the Bible, you, you don't have that. Um, in the Bible, you got sin as a sin, all right? And since we've been in the book of James, let's go back to the book of James. All right, so, book of James... Let's see, where are we? Hebrews and James. Okay, so when we take a look at James chapter 2 and in verse number 10, just one quick little two quick little verses of Scripture. James chapter 2 and verse number 10. It says, For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. Okay? And so here you've got God's law that shows the righteousness that He requires. And you could keep that whole law, but if you break just one little bit, you're, you're, you're guilty of breaking it all. Okay? And it just, when, when you look at it in terms of like, you know, illustrating it with civil law, it, it makes a little bit of sense. You know, you've got um, somebody who is in the penitentiary and he's there because of, uh, you know, murder and rape and terroristic threatening and, uh, you know, weapons charges and everything like that. Really bad guy. And then you've got somebody who's in there for, um, you know, larceny. And he said, well, I'm not a criminal. I'm not like that guy. Well, you're right. You're not like that guy. But, yeah, you're still a criminal, right? <laughs> you know, when you, when you break the law, you're, you're a criminal. And so it doesn't really matter if you break a lot of laws or a little law. That's just the way it is. And so here you've got God's law. And if you break the God's law in one little point, then you're guilty of breaking the entire thing. And so um, you got to realize that, that the standard that God has is a standard of perfection, and we fall short of that standard, and so that's where the grace of God and the mercy of God comes into play to gives, give us the righteousness of Christ when we accept Jesus as our Savior. But kind of getting to this idea about differing degrees of sin, you know, there, there, there really isn't differing degrees of sin as far as God is concerned from an absolute perspective. Now, as what we talked about earlier, you know, again, I would rather um, you, you hate my guts than pull out a gun and shoot me. When you look at it at a practical sense, there is the idea that there's going to be some sins that carry more weight than others. And when you look at the Bible... All you have to do is just look up the word abomination in uh, Bible word search. You're going to find that, you know, there are certain sins God considers to be an abomination. And you say, well, what is an abomination? Well, an abomination is just something that's really bad and detestable and uh, we, we, we don't like it. Okay. Or in this case, God doesn't like it. It's just simply something that, that stinks to high heaven for him. And it's not as if, you, I mean, I guess you could go and you could list all the things that are abominations to God. But, you know, if, if you really stop and think about it, God has this absolute sense where all sin is sin. Um, but he also has the sense that, you know, there are certain things that he's going to tolerate more than other things as well. And so whenever that tipping point is, that's when God usually starts to jump in and act. And so, uh, you know, I don't know that you could necessarily, you know, list out sins and say, okay, if, if you stay away from these things, you're okay. If you do things, you know, you're okay over here. And I don't think that God works that way because then we're kind of going back here to th this type of thing, right? You know, as long as we get real, no, that's not the idea at all. 
what God really wants for us to do is to stay away from that path and go up this path altogether, right? Okay, and so, you know, we can't really say, all right, don't do these things because these things are really bad and God's going to really, you know, get on to you. These things, well, they're still bad, but they're not so bad, so you can do them. No, just don't do any of them. Does that make sense? Okay, so um, here's the other part of the question, and that is this. Are there some sins that aren't able to be forgiven? And there is a sin in the Bible that is called the unpardonable sin. So let's take a look at Matthew chapter 12. And let's take a look at what this unpardonable sin is. Now, while you're flipping there, remember we've got Matthew chapter 12. Now, in Matthew chapter 12, we've got opposition opposition to Jesus really ratcheting up. And we've got a situation at the first part of this chapter where Jesus heals a man on the Sabbath day. And from that point forward, we see that the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were plotting how they're going to kill him. And so we've got increasing opposition to Jesus building until in this chapter, it's reaching a point that they're really ready to just get rid of him altogether. And so the amount of hatred that the Pharisees and the, the scribes have for Jesus is, is really, really bad at this point. So now we see that in the last part of this chapter, well, the middle part of the chapter, is that here it comes this demon-possessed man um, that Jesus heals. People's all astonished in verse number 23. They're wondering, could this be the son of David. And so they're, they've got a question in their mind. Is this really the Christ? They're, 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 you know, in between two different decisions. They're thinking, you know, maybe he is, but at the same time, they're like, well, you know what? M maybe not. They're not really ready to commit to anything. And so in verse number 25 or 24, the Pharisees heard this and said, it is only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. And so they're, what they're trying to do is pull people and persuade people to reject Jesus. And what the argument that they're trying to do is saying the only way that he's able to um, um, cast out demons is because he is the prince of demons. He tells demons what to do, and so therefore that's how he's able to cast them out. Which Jesus in verse number 25 knows her thoughts and said, Every kingdom divided itself will be ruined, and every city and household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How can his kingdom stand? In other words, he's saying, you guys don't even know what you're talking about. You know, here, here is Satan advancing his kingdom with demon obsession, but now he is tearing down his own demon, uh, his own kingdom by casting the demons out. That doesn't make any sense. Does it? It doesn't. And he also says in verse number 27, And if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your people drive them out? Look, guys, if you're going to accuse me of doing this, you got to turn the shoe on the other foot. All right? So, continuing on down into verse number 30, he says, He is, who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. And so I tell you, Every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men. So there you go. You know, it doesn't matter what sin it is. Sin will be forgiven. Blasphemy will be forgiven. But he goes on to say this. The blasphemy against the spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the son of man will be forgiven. But anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven either in this age or or in the age to come. Can't now, Jesus. we're into that. I'm giving you the long version. Now, here's the question. How were they blaspheming against the Spirit? How were they speaking against the Spirit? Here's how. By what power was Jesus casting out the demons? Power of the God yeah. or the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Now, what were they calling that power? They're giving it credit to Satan. Okay? So you see that, you know, they their rejection of Jesus has gotten to the point. And remember, these guys are wanting to kill Jesus. 
okay? These aren't guys that just, you know, have a little beef with him. They want to kill him. And their view of Jesus is he is so evil, he is operating by the uh, prince of, of, of demons, okay? So if you think about it in that regard, you know, when somebody gets to that point in their heart and in their life, how are they ever going to turn to Jesus to be forgiven? They're not. And if they don't turn to Jesus to be forgiven, then, you know, they're standing on their own merits. If they would turn to Jesus, then all their sins could be forgiven. But if they got to that point, then they're not going anywhere. All right? And so that's why some people say, oh, well, the unpardonable sin, and it's right, is to say a rejection of Jesus. When somebody rejects Jesus to the point that that's all, in period, in a way, and done with, then, yeah, they're, they're standing on their own merits, and there's, there's no possibility for forgiveness of sins. Now, that isn't to say that, you know, somebody's feeling convicted of, of, of you know, for salvation, and they say, no, I don't, I don't want to be saved, and, and they go away. You know, that's not the same thing, you know. The only time that you can say for sure that, you know, it's, it's this is when, um, you know, either when they die to begin with, you know, and they reject him all the way to that point, or it gets to the point where God, in his knowledge, knows, hey, this person has just completely rejected me, you know. And we don't know that. And so you can't go up to somebody and say, hey, you know what? God dealt with you here, 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 and now it's too late. You don't have a chance anymore. You don't know that. I don't know that. I, I, you know, but the Lord does. But we've got to understand that the, the sin that isn't able to be forgiven is uh, to not accept the sacrifice that can forgive us of our sins. Does that make sense? Okay. Anybody got any questions or comments on that one? Well, yes, but here's this but is what I'm saying. That they would ever... What? Okay, here is here is a line. Okay, since we've got stick figures going tonight. Okay, so we got our stick figure guy right, and he's going along his path, and at all these turns, he's rejecting Jesus, right? And then he's coming up to the point where, you know, it's, he's at the end of the road. Okay? It is. It's a big, thick double bar there. All right. No passing go at that point. Um, you know, obviously, if he hasn't accepted Jesus Christ by this point right here, he ain't gonna. Right? What's that? And God knows that. But is there a point here or here or here that God knows, you know what, this guy isn't, this guy isn't uh, accepting me? You know? I mean, th there could very well be a point like what we were talking about with um, um, the Antichrist, you know, and how God is sending upon them a powerful delusion so that they would be condemned. I mean, you know, at that point in the end times, when somebody starts to uh, worship the Antichrist, when they start to take the mark of the beast, and no, the vaccination is not the mark of the beast. We don't have the mark of the beast. Don't fall for that, okay? Um, but here's the thing. At, at some point, you know, somebody may hit that point in their life. You and I don't know what that point is. God does. And so if we're looking at a person, we're saying, oh, well, you rejected one time. You rejected two times. You, oh, three strikes, you're out. No, not necessarily. Okay? There may be some other times here that God gives them. Does that make sense? Okay. But it's not that God is making them that way. They're no. Well, it's the same thing with the Pharisees and the, and the, the teachers of the law. They had gotten to the point where their view of Jesus is that he is so wicked and so evil and so bad, he is operating by the power of Satan. 
You know, when, when your view of, of Jesus is that bad, how do you ever come away from that? Especially when you're trying to convince other people of that. I mean, it just, you know, you are, you are so deceived and your heart is so hard. You know, at that point, it's like, but then again, I, you know, I don't know and you don't know because the Apostle Paul was that way when the Lord met him on the way to Damascus. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Judas is scary. Now, Judas could have been forgiven if he would have turned to the Lord, but he had gone so far, he would not turn to the Lord. You know, there's the key. Yeah. Well, what Jesus is saying, well, no, it's an unforgivable sin. To reject Jesus Christ as your Savior is an unforgivable sin. You know, we, we sometimes think, oh, well, the big sins are adultery, the big sins are murder, the big sins are this and that. You know, the biggest sin of all is to reject Jesus Christ as somebody's Savior. And you think, well, wait a minute, just rejecting Jesus Christ, that doesn't hurt anybody. But if you stop and think about it, what greater offense can there be to God than to take His, His only begotten, beloved Son, give that person, uh, you know, give that Son as a sacrifice, and then have that turn around and throw him back in your face? I mean, have you ever done something nice to somebody to have them turn around and just throw it back in your face? It makes you mad, right? Yes. And so if you were to imagine to take something that is the most precious thing to you that could ever be and give that person that as a gift and have them trample all over it, that's unforgivable, right? It's yes. Pretty, pretty so here's the thing, okay? And that is that Jesus Christ dies for the sins of the whole world, and now people either accept that sacrifice and have that forgiveness, or they stand on their own merits. When they make the choice that, no, I'm rejecting that sacrifice, that's the unforgivable sin. It's, it's pretty simple if you think about it. If you murder somebody, God does not automatically forgive you. You lie, God does not automatically forgive you. If you reject Him, He does not automatically forgive you. If you ask God to forgive you for your sins, then He forgives you. And you cannot ask God to forgive you by rejecting God's forgiveness. It's it's a contradiction. Yeah. Mm. Right. The only sin that God won't forgive you for is rejecting His forgiveness. That's not rejecting his forgiveness. Yeah, that's that's what I'm saying is that okay. In this confused by time, it's it's God is without time. You accept his forgiveness, then you accept his forgiveness. So Chloe, in that example, we're gonna of course you've already accepted Jesus' forgiveness, but hypothetically speaking, this is gonna be, you know, Chloe too. All right. Okay. And so, you know, number one, Chloe too says, No, I don't want to accept it. Okay. Chance number two, Chloe two says, no, I don't want to accept it, you know. Chance number three, Chloe two says, no, I don't want to, to accept it, right? You know, at certain point, you're going to run into this wall, and it's going to be too late. Chloe two is, all right? But if Chloe two gets to a point in her life where she is just not having it, her heart has become so hardened that she just completely and utterly rejects this, then her choice has been made, and she's not going back on her choice. And that's what this is. Now, I don't know what that is, and you don't know what that is. It's there, but we can't look at it and say, hey, that's it. I mean, you know, practically speaking, we can see, oh yeah, somebody, they, they don't want to have anything to do with it, but you got a situation like Paul on the road to Damascus, where he did. Dustin? Does that mean that salvation can be lost even though you keep professing 
Yeah, no. Okay. No. 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 This is this is for somebody who is who is yet to be saved. Okay. Okay. This is somebody who is rejecting being saved. You know, one times, two times, three times, or however many times. Okay. And, and is it a sin to say, pray the sinner prayer a million times to, to overdo it? Well, I mean, um, it does show a lack of faith, doesn't it? Okay. But you did sincerely meant it every time, Paul. Well, it you know when 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 you're saved, you're born again. All right. And so you know if you think about being born into this world, you're only born one time. Yeah. Physically right. speaking, you know when you accept Jesus Christ, you're born again. Yeah. But that only happens one time. Okay. And you're made a new creation, and so I can see that there are are Christians who are who are truly Christians. All right. You know, but they're they're so weak in their um, thinking about Jesus' grace and Jesus' forgiveness. They're constantly going back, constantly asking for forgiveness. And really what needs to happen is you just need to, you know, in, in terms of, of to ask for salvation, not for, for just sins. But, you know, I need to keep on asking God to forgive me so I can be saved. No, you, you, you are saved. And you got to... Stand in the grace of God and rest in His assurance, not in ours. Exactly, exactly. And and to tell you the truth, you know, when you talk about the sinner's prayer, yeah. there is not the sinner's prayer. You know, some people will look at the sinner's prayer much like a work for salvation. If I say these words and say them sincerely, then therefore I am going to prove my, my righteousness before God. And that's not what salvation is. Salvation is to believe that Jesus Christ is our Savior and to trust Him. And then from that trust, to go to Him and, uh, you know, ask Him for it, to confess it. You know, and that's not particular words. And when we start to look at it as far as particular words then aren't we just simply doing works for salvation?